I'll wait for uh, my slides are under session five. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk a, about imaging and how it impacts bronchoscopy. And we've heard a lot about um, cone beam CT bronchoscopy. We've heard a lot about digital tomosynthesis from Bobby and um, talking about body vision from Kyle. And so it's really important to understand that imaging is paramount for us to be able to have successful biopsies. When we talk about imaging, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And we've talked about this ad nauseum today, but just to kind of give you a rundown of how at least I perceive CT to body divergence, is that when we do a CT scan in the, pre in the planning portion of our, of our procedure, a patient is lying inside of a CT scanner with their arms up, and usually a robot voice will say, please take a deep breath, and then hold it. And so patients will take a deep breath, they'll go to total lung capacity, ideally, and then they'll take a picture. And then when you're undergoing the procedure at the time of bronchoscopy, your lungs are much smaller, um, and you'll be intubated, sedated, and so there'll be some significant divergence, as you can see in this image right here. Uh, sorry. So when we talk about virtual bronchoscopy and this discrepancy of CT to body divergence, I'm going to painfully take you through this one particular slide. So when we were talking about that CT scan, we were talking about how a patient would take a big deep breath in and they would hold it at ideally total lung capacity, but patients don't always follow directions. So as a result, they end up being in the inspiratory reserve volume. So your pre-procedural computer, computer CT scan is done in the inspiratory reserve volume or total lung capacity, whereas when you're doing your bronchoscopy, you ideally think you're gonna be in the in tidal volume breathing, but in reality, there's significant atelectasis uh, when you're performing bronchoscopy, whether it is with conventional bronchoscopy or ven conventional ventilation or with uh, advanced um, ad uh, anesthesia techniques. So instead of being in the tidal volume, you might be down here in the expiratory reserve volume. Now, you can see the discrepancy between being down here and then being way up here near total lung capacity. And so ultimately, this is a result of one of the studies that I had done at my site, um, looking at patients that had a pre-procedural scan done here and then at the time of the biopsy with conventional ventilation. In fact, four papers have shown that atelectasis occurs about 36% to 41% with cone beam imaging studies, demonstrating that atelectasis is a significant problem. Sometimes you can see that the lung lesion itself is completely obscured or partially obscured. However, when you use a lung ventilation protocol, typically I use high PEEP, high tidal volume, uh, and prolonged inspiratory breath holds. And that's beyond the scope of this talk, but I encourage you to at least think about using some form of ventilation strategy. And there's many of them that you can pick from. When we start talking about imaging, a lot of people, um, at least when I was training about 10 to 15 years ago, radioprobe EBUS was the only form of imaging that we had. It was considered real time, it is real time, but there's major problems with Rebus. One is, is that it's to just lateral looking. You can't look forward. Um, the images lack directionality. So even if you see any centric view, you don't even know which way to go. And then non-aerated portions of the lung or atelectatic lung or hemorrhage can give you a false positive. And then you'll biopsy tissue that's normal and you ultimately end up with a non-diagnostic result. And if you look at these, this is from uh, the ILOCITE study that was published uh, by Cigar and Chest. And if you look at these images, this is atelectasis. If you think about this for a second, you think you're so good, you drive out, you get a nice concentric view, or you get a nice eccentric view, but what you're biopsying is collapsed lung. And so it's really important that we look at imaging to solve this problem. So the first venture for us has been uh, digital tomosynthesis. And digital tomosynthesis is not a new technology. It's a technology that was in breast, and so this has been adopted into the lung. And so this is just history repeating itself. And now there's a number of different platforms, including Medtronic, 
with the Illumis site, which is a good platform, Body Vision as well with their AI technology, and now NOAA Medical, which is utilizing robotics in conjunction with integrated digital tomosynthesis. And so when we talk about, um, let me go back here. When we talk about digital tomosynthesis, what's happening is that you're doing this fluoroscopic sweep, you're taking multiple 2D images, you're stacking them, and then you're starting to make um, images. Now, the one thing that you should know is with digital tomosynthesis that there's going to be some, um, some limitations, especially with uh, atelectasis, um, excessive chest wall girth, et cetera. But the main thing that you should take away from this is that when we moved from virtual bronchoscopy to digital, we're starting to correct for that CT to body divergence. And anybody who tells you that shape sensing has minimal or no CT to body divergence is wrong. Um, I'm, I use ION a lot. Let me see if I can get this to play. And you can see here I'm driving out into the right middle lobe using a uh, pre-planned pathway going to the correct subsegments. And then you think you're going to end up seeing this blue segmented target that is the actual lesion. And then you can see here me navigating out deep into the periphery. And then when you'll start to see the, the uh, turquoise colored segmented target, you think that you're actually on the target. So I use comb beam to mitigate CT to body divergence. And if you look at this freeze frame right here where you get this high level of confidence, but look where I'm actually at. This is laughable, but unfortunately there's a patient on the table. So imaging matters. It matters more than which robot you use, which catheter system you use. And so this is just to drive home the point that no matter what you do in terms of your catheter system, you've got to have imaging as an integrated portion of successful peripheral navigation. When we look at digital tomosynthesis, these images are really remarkable. It doesn't matter which vendor you use, in Lumisite, Lung Vision, and even Galaxy. Galaxy uh, utilizes tool and lesion technology where you can actually put in whatever tool you want and you can actually see it, and it's a robotic platform, whereas the other two, you can utilize different modalities with the prefix catheters. So digital tomosynthesis, we talked a little bit about. What are, what are the problems with digital tomosynthesis? Well, the first off, you're prone to marsh, motion artifact more so than with comb beam because it takes a while to do that sweep. With comb beam, you can do a, uh, a complete spin in five to eight seconds. Lesions close to the chest wall, the diaphragm, the cardiac border may not be well visualized. Atelectasis can obscure lesions. So with digital tomosynthesis, it's really hard or very difficult to make out lesions that are adjacent or partially obscured by atelectasis. It's just, it just very difficult. And then, like with all bronchoscopy and all imaging uh, modalities, or even radiologists, the more experience you have with DT, the better off you are. I can guarantee you uh, that Bobby Majahan is better than me at digital tomosynthesis because he's used it a lot more than I have. Now, the biggest problem with digital tomosynthesis is the z-axis. The z-axis is when you're going AP, uh, anterior posterior. Lung lesions that are located in the center or lateral tend to do better with digital tomosynthesis. In the z-axis, you, uh, you're at the edge of the technology, it's, more bl it's blurrier, it's more difficult to tell where you are. NOAA came out with a way of trying to mitigate these issues with digital tomosynthesis. This is pretty novel and actually quite simple. What they did is they said, let's find out what the best image is with the needle or the tool and compare it with the best image of that of the actual lesion. And then if there's a divergence or a, dis or a difference of greater than four millimeters, it's not tool and lesion. And if it's less than four millimeters, then it's tool and lesion. They call this the Tomo Reconstruction Coordinate Technique. Uh, I think when they get the marking department, it's gonna call it uh, strike point. Now, when we talk about digital tomosynthesis, I like to, I don't wanna sound uh, that it's not a great technology, but it's like kind of two, 2D and a half. It's not quite there. Um, and it's not quite applicable to every single lung nodule that you see. And so currently, the gold standard is cone beam CT bronchoscopy. The difference between these 2D uh, 
2D images that are stacked on top of each other to create this kind of three-dimensional uh, 2D and a half with digital tomosynthesis. This is actually a cone of radiation that goes to a flat panel detector, and then it spins around the patient 270 degrees, and thereby creating um, images that are comparable to that to a multi-detector uh, CT scan. Um, it's less prone to uh, motion artifact because you're doing a spin within five to eight seconds. And then with cone beam, you can actually increase your workflow efficiency. And early users and early diagnostic yield is somewhere between 92 and 94 percent. And now the literature is actually showing that. So if you want to be very good and have a very high diagnostic yield, then you need to have better imaging than no imaging. So standard flow is down here, then you have uh, digital tomosynthesis, and then you have cone beam. Now, this is a paper comparing cone beam CT, uh, cone beam CT imaging to, to a multi-detector flat panel scans that you would have in a traditional scanner. So cone beam is literally a cone that comes to the flat panel detector. And then fan beam, which is a multi-detector CT scan, is as a small triangular, but it has multiple heads, so that way you can do 64 slices, 128 slices, et cetera. And then it creates a 3D volumetric reconstruction. And when you compare cone beam versus multi-detector CT, the lung is perfect. With cone beam, you cannot see soft tissue densities very well. It's not good for the abdomen. It's not good for the leg. It's very good for bones, which is why ortho uses it. But for the lung, it's perfect. And if you, if you look at this cone beam image from my machine and the pre-planned CT image, this is pretty good. This is very good. You have a lot of confidence. So I'm, now I'm going to take you, uh, we're going to try and publish a 600 uh, patient series on strike, on center strike. But this is the first 200 that we did with the robot and unpublished data. So we did 208 patients with a total of 221 lesions. Here you can see an ion image with a uh, tool and lesion and center strike. And we have a CATSIS diagnostic yield of 95%. If you convert that over to acquire, it's 84 percent. Complication rate of around 2 percent, with pneumothorax being the major issue, and chest tube placement in just three patients. So it's acceptable. The one thing with cone beam that you can do and you cannot do with any other modality is you can guarantee yourself tool and lesion, basically. So we had 99 percent tool and lesion. 1% tool touch lesion. Why would that happen? Well, some lesions are like a toothpick and an olive where you kind of you push and then it doesn't quite penetrate the lesion. Or you're up against the pleura and you're not really, you don't want to actually go center strike, but you, you want to get close enough. And then sometimes there's um, tissue distortion where the lung nodule will just move away from the catheter and no matter how many times you image, how many times you spin, you can't penetrate the actual lesions. So you'll have to use something like forceps, a cryobiopsy to get to it. But what this is astonishing is you can get to 83% center strike. And what does center strike mean? Center strike means the center of a lung lesion in three orthogonal planes, axosagittal coronal. And so that's an amazing number. So then with this, you'll be able to potentially do therapeutics, ablation, et cetera. When you get to that level of high tool and lesion, tool touch lesion and center strike, you start to have better diagnostic yields, for, definitely for malignant disease, but also for benign disease. Benign disease is really difficult for us in the traditional world. And if in the United States, you know, the standard uh, patient undergoes uh, 1.6 biopsy attempts for a lung nodule. That means 42% of patients in the United States with all this great technology will need a second biopsy. And so we go through this you know, endless journey with the patient. We have a, a non-diagnostic CT guided biopsy, non-diagnostic navigation bronchoscopy. Then they have to go through potential surgery, and then we have to go down one, one case after another. But if you have a high negative predictive value, meaning that it's actually benign, 86.75% uh, is very good, which means that you have confidence to tell that patient, hey, we're just gonna image you. We're gonna still follow you as per, you know, standard guidelines, but we have confidence that it's not cancer. 
It's not malignant. And we need to get to this point to be successful. Now, these images are exactly where everybody wants to be in this room at some point in the future. So I thought I was a hotshot when I came out of IP Fellowship. I did something around 200 to 400 cases over the years, built my practice. And then I went into the cone beam room, and there isn't enough of me to be able to do more interventional cases. What happened with ION when we introduced our robotic bronchoscopy is that things became easier. I didn't have to hold a scope. I didn't have to, these are wheels in, wheels out. This is not the ION data. This is actual time in the room. We went from 180 minutes to down to 80 minutes. And if I fast forward now, we're down to 66 minutes. That's how fast we are now. So basically, we can do five to six cases with mediastinal staging, sometimes with multiple lung nodules, sometimes even with prone bronchoscopy. And then you start thinking about where, where does this technology start to make a difference? So we've, we've already done this. So essentially, this is CT guiding into a biopsy. We were doing navigational bronchoscopy. Um, and if you look at the CPT codes in, in the United States, we were still in the top five. I think Bobby was always number one for a long time. So I can't catch up with him. Um, but essentially, when we went into the cone beam room, you'll never see anything like this in medicine a straight line. We introduced robotics, and we were able to do additional cases. And then we saw this convergence. It just took us two years to convince interventional radiology that cone beam was the way to go. This is where we're headed. Now, one, a few closing thoughts. CBCT fixed uh, has augmented fluoroscopy. It's superior to that of mobile. If you ever buy a mobile, Make sure you think about radiation. How many of you know what ALARA is? Those are radiation mitigation strategies to achieve radiation doses that are as low as reasonably achievable. That means wearing double-sided lead, wearing ro uh, radiation glasses, et cetera, and there is a, a learning curve, and there's actually established literature um, by the Norwegian group, or the Netherlands group, um, stating that it takes a, a number of cases to be able to be good at cone beam. I'm going to end with, this is my last slide. This is how we're going to think about this in the future. We know sputum cytology, this is diagnostic yield on the bottom, invasiveness over here. Sputum cytology doesn't work. Traditional bronchoscopy for lesions less than two centimeters, it was on your, one of your slides, is 14%. So if anybody comes up with you with a traditional scope and your lesions less than 2%, you should run out of the room. EBIS and navigation, 70, 70 plus percent. That's kind of where we are. That's not a bad number. Um, with the new Illumis side, it may be higher into the eight, 70s, uh, high 70s to low 80s. And then we get to CTFNA. And CTFNA, now you're moving up the invasiveness. You're having higher levels of morbidity, mortality, length of stay, chest tubes. And then you have, as a diagnostic modality, VATS lung biopsy. I live in the um, histo belt in the United States where histoplasmosis is endemic. So the one thing about histo is it looks exactly like lung cancer. And so that's a huge problem for me because I, had a lot, I have a lot of benign disease. And so uh, the, in the United States, uh, according to the New England Journal of Medicine Tanner study, 30% of uh, surgical lung biopsies is for benign disease. So these patients actually get to go through the experience of lung cancer and they never even had it. And so I plead with you, this is not bronchoscopy, cone beam CT bronchoscopy is something that we're trying to do very well in the United States. It's something that you need to think about. Um, and as it becomes more uh, affordable, adopt as quickly as possible. Because this is where we want to be. We want to have a low level of invasiveness with extraordinarily high diagnostic yield so we can obviate the need for surgical intervention. And then after that, we can talk about therapeutics and we can, do, we can maybe do lung sparing uh, treatments and we can look towards the future. Thank you. <laughs>